My talk is about how to build artificial minds. Uh, and the way a systems approach is foundational to that, both in building one, the kinds of systems that you could say are minds, possibly, and the kinds of systems it'll take to get us to that point. Um, to set some expectations here, I'm going to move fairly quickly. A lot of this talk has things that go into a fair degree of technical depth. Uh, so to that end, I have an annotated slides out on a repo uh, that you could take a look at if you want to dive into more info or if you want to file issues to ask for more information or clarification or um, let me know that you think I, certain things were wrong or misleading. That's all fine. Uh, I'm probably not going to end up with time for questions, but maybe I will. Um, first, it's probably worth saying a little bit about who I am. Uh, so like a lot who are involved with data science, machine learning, etc., I'm a bit of an academic refugee. I didn't stick around in the academy. I went out elsewhere. Uh, a lot of academia didn't appeal to me. I had a very strange graduate and undergraduate education such that both of those were dominated a lot more by the interdisciplinary parts than they were by any specific discipline's take on things. Um, I got introduced to modern machine learning uh, as an early graduate student when I was looking at ways of combining hyperspectral imagery uh, in aerial photography satellite imagery to other rasterized geospatial products to try to put together predictive maps to find archaeological sites. So not the normal way that people tend to get into machine learning. Um, I did PhD work in uh, geography instead of archaeology where I was going through uh, building an automation pipeline to detect and extract urban imagery. Uh, I used a lot of carefully hand-engineered features, and by the time I was done, this thing was basically out of date due to the changes that were coming about with deep learning and convolutional neural nets. Um, anyways, I worked concurrently in industry. I was doing ap academic research at the same time in my spare time, and I ended up leaving both academia and the scientific industry that I trained in. Because uh, at that point, I was looking for better answers for the software problems I was up against. And yes, that's what my daily reality was. The software problems were stopping me from doing the type of scientific work that I wanted to do, much more than I thought was reasonable. Something like the equivalent of having linear and quadratic searches when I should have had hash maps and indexes. Um, so I went from old school numerics and a lot of languages that dealt with that to Python. And I was like, oh, great, all my problems are solved. Not so much, but um, in my spare time here and there, I had learned a little bit of scheme. I had worked through structure and interpretation of computer programs. I had done some Scala here and there and online courses. And then I found this little language called Clojure. Uh, the other side I'll make, just uh, because I can, is that I also make uh, electronic music, retro future synthesizer music as pattern shift. Um, trying to one-up the people who put out their SoundCloud out there by doing my Spotify link. Anyways, so <laughs> having left the geospatial and space industries and academia, I still have this strong sense of a need for ongoing research projects. It's kind of how I feel I should be using my time. Um, and I'm out of this publisher parish short-term goal grind, um, worrying about you know H2 scores or whatever. And so I can kind of spend that spare time doing whatever I want, even if it sounds a little crazy. Uh, so I started thinking about what I thought was a pretty big, long shot problem for this time, which is how to go about building an artificial mind, something that couples all these neat tricks and behaviors with some kind of understanding. Uh, to be clear, I'm not talking about this. I'm not talking about building out a notebook that produces one model that then is somebody else's problem to deploy at one point in time. Uh, I'm not talking about sort of the overhype and overselling that's going on right now that's uh, a little troubling. What I'm talking about is making serious progress on creating systems that just about anyone would agree to call genuinely intelligent. Uh, so what do I mean by the term mind in this context? Well, I'll go a little uh, indirect here. Something just like a basis for sense-making and goal-directed behavior. Uh, these are two things that I think often are missing in a lot of systems that are out there. I like the term artificial minds. It aims high. It does hit some of those uncomfortable philosophical points that I think are worth exploring. And it encompasses things that are people are calling strong or general artificial intelligence. It implies something that's online, adapting to new situations. It's not just fancy hierarchical regression with a new name. 
Um, I know modern AI textbooks, classes, the discipline, it goes out of its way to tell you this is not what AI is really about. It's just about A star search and constraint propagation. And that stuff's really cool, but I think there's something more to intelligence, and what I want to focus on is the something more. So if I want to put out a big problem like this, I need some way to figure out where is a goal? How can I make progress on it? What's something I should even be able to do if this is something I can build? And this entails answering the question, how could I even tell if something had a mind? Well, how do I infer that other people have minds? Now, it's certainly not a fail safe system, but it has something to do with their behavior. In some way, I can map their behavior onto my behavior and so on. And I think the focus on behavior is the correct one. And in software, we have uh, you know, an instinct for this that we should write out the system's behavior in terms of requirements, the contracts of the system, and not couple that to the specifics of the implementation. And that's kind of what I mean here. This is a methodological constraint, an empirical constraint. I'm not saying, it's not an ontological commitment. I'm not saying behavior is all that there is or matters, uh, but this is a way of having a measurable goal. And if we accept that constraint, we can set criteria for progress in those terms. So here I'm gonna invoke a famous way of formulating this in AI, you know, through question answering, a test of whether or not a behavior is adequate or something to be said to have a mind. You know what I mean, right? The voigt kampf test. You're all familiar with this. We, uh, as seen in Blade Runner, if you're not. Uh, the goal is you sit down something that's apparently human in front of you, uh, and you're trying to determine with a bunch of expert questions whether this thing is really an artificial being, a replicant. So you ask very difficult questions, and you observe the different aptitudes and biases exhibited. And, you know, I think you all know I was kind of leading towards the Turing test here, but I like to invoke this other fictional test because we've all grown accustomed to caricatures of the Turing test. That things, oh, it passed as human. This Twitter bot fooled a teenager for 10 minutes online into thinking it was really in love with him. That's not really what the Turing test means. And I think it's important that we take these sorts of things seriously because they can potentially provide good metrics. Uh, so here's an example of one of these questions you might ask in your voigt kampf test. Picture the letters J and D. Now rotate the D 90 degrees to the left. Put the D on the J. What weather does this make you think of? Slowly, some you know, people are getting it here, right? Rain, you're making an umbrella. Um, this is an example that was adapted from a podcast I heard Daniel Dennett on. Um, and if you can answer a whole lot of questions like this, you'll convince me that something mind-like is going on in there. I don't think Alexa or Siri is gonna get this. Um, probably not Watson without some prep team time and warning. Um, and this is the sort of thing that's beyond the state of the art. But we know in software engineering, how do you solve problems like this? You have to break it down into parts. Um, and what are the solution components? We have to be able to make sense of language, to know what the question means. We have to engage in some type of multimodal reasoning. We have to go back and forth between language and visual imagery. And that mental imagery needs to include both abstract and photoreal components. Um, and then we have some kind of world model. What's an umbrella for? Uh, we have to make sense of either our own experiences or the testimony of others in the form of data or otherwise uh, so that we can reason from that. And we have to be able to reason from those things quickly and in a systemic way. And we've made progress in machine learning on each of these pieces. So we can use generative models that go from categories to instances of images. We have deep convolutional net approaches that can take us from the abstract to photoreal and back, and they can take us from either an abstract or a photoreal example to a label. We can link languages and image models with image captioning. This is you know, done a lot. Visual QA is another case where this is done. And we know how to do things like label scenes with respect to weather, so we might be able to short circuit that last world model bit. Uh, but these things are not out there in big systems where all these gears are turning together. They're little pieces, they're task specific, and they're fairly untested when it comes to far generalization. So, and of course humans, we can do better, right? It might take you a little longer, but if you get the alighted form of this question, you can still answer that. Um, we can also resolve ambiguous phrases. So here, one person dies every five seconds from smoking, reveal scientist. If it's not obvious to you what the incorrect reading is because your world model does such a good job with it, uh, the answer is not there exists one person such that that person dies every five seconds from smoking. Uh, so quantifiers are tricky. Uh, here's another ambiguous sentence. Um, there's a system at work here, right? 
your language processing can't handle all this by itself, but it has a world model that's constantly integrated with it, making sense of things. What do you get when you cross a joke with a rhetorical question? So, and this is important, right? Pragmatics is just an important part of meaning as semantics is. So these are like sort of a cute way of running through some of the problems. But the problem is, is there understanding on the other side of this thing, or is it just a bunch of trickery? And if we want to make progress on this, well, the first thing we have to do is get started from where we are. Uh, and how do we get started at solving the problems at all and trying to build systems out of things? Uh, to me, the most important part is starting with good representations of the problems. Now, if you follow the world of people arguing about software on the internet, you might have seen discussions about two different attempts to write a Sudoku solver. Uh, there was one by Ron Jeffries that involved some OO and test-driven development, uh, and one by Peter Norvig where he just kind of seemed like he sat down and solved the problem after thinking about it. Now, that's a simplified version, and I don't think the story actually tells us anything about test-driven development and objects. What it tells us is that when Peter Norvig sat down to solve the problem, he already knew how to solve it. The important thing for me is when somebody sits down to solve a problem like this, and they know how to solve those problems, what's the first thing they do? And the first thing that Peter Norvig did in this case is he sat down and he devised good data literal representations of the Sudoku board and the constraints that could apply to it and so on. So this is, this is an important thing. If you know how to solve problems, you start by figuring out what representations are gonna help you. Now, if you've run into bad representations, you know it's much harder than it needs to to get started or make progress. Like who wants to do long division with this number, right? It's really not much better than a tally system. Um, it's not a whole lot in the ways of abstraction. And if you're a closurist, you likely get how good representations are important for problem solving. For me, that's part of why I'm in closure in the first place. One of the first things that appealed to me, just looking at the language code examples and so on, these rich data literal representations, there's so many good affordances both for the programmer and for the way that programs actually operate. Um, and then, you know, in the lower example, here is something that mirrors Datomic's uh, universal fact schema. This facilitates the indexing system, the regular structure for the query clauses, and so on. All these things fall out of the representation and thinking and working hard to get to a good representation for the type of problems that we're up against. Uh, but what does it mean if you're trying to learn a representation? And if that representation is learned with a technique like backpropagation and neural nets, and that means you're just juggling around a bunch of real valued vectors here and there, uh, that, that's a trickier question. So in a sense, we're crossing philosophical paradigms. Um, I have a reference point here to one philosopher at two points in time. Uh, the younger Wittgenstein laid out the datomic world model. There are atomic facts. That's the case. And then we can form propositions that relate to those and reason by working from there. Uh, but as the old Wittgenstein points out, when you're dealing with natural language, there are a whole other set of complications that come in. You're talking about a conditioned understanding where words come to mean things based on their history and their use in context in the language. Um, now, recurrent neural nets and the language models based on them take the older Wittgenstein literally. Uh, in natural language models that use recurrent nets, LSTMs, and so on, we iterate through a corpus of documents. We build a representation of word meaning from you know, ingram, skipgrams, bidirectional context. Anytime you see these words, it's just a different way of operationalizing this assumption that the word comes from, the meaning of the word comes from its context. Um, these are all ways of formalize, formalizing that fact. Uh, but when I first started looking at this, I definitely had one immediate question that came to my mind, which is why do this at all? Why not build a logical system for handling the same problems? It certainly works in particular subdomains for certain types of parsers and things. And I think it's possibly non-obvious. Uh, obviously, a lot of people fought over it in philosophy, historical computer science, treatments of AI. Um, probably some here are skeptical holdouts, hoping that if you just ignore deep learning, it will go away and quit bothering you. Uh, and I, I also agree, your skepticism is warranted. Machine learning systems are complicated. They make systems a lot harder to reason about, predict, understand, and test, all of it. You're correct to be wary of them. Uh, but we only, in my mind, have one good example of intelligence with all its bells and whistles, and it's human beings. And the point here is not to make it like a human, but to think about why do humans do it? What are the benefits? What's the cost-benefit analysis of this? 
not the literal case of backpropagation and vector dot products, but the biological systems that inspire them. And it's at least true that human learning is limited in its precision. It's a kind of empirical calibration. And it's also kind of surprisingly mindless. You know, sometimes you can reason through things consciously and you discover a solution. Uh, but a lot of the times you go to sleep not knowing something and then you wake up and you know it. Um, or not knowing how to do it, and you wake up and you know how to do it. And sometimes the answer you're looking for comes to you in the shower or on a run, maybe in your hammock. And it's kind of like a voice from another world. It's this weird thing that you're surfing on, this knowledge that you have. So, and that's, that's just the learning part, right? Not all parts of human behavior are learned. A lot is hard-coded in the brain. So if, for instance, you hear an unexpected sound, your eyes will turn and look at that. There's a hard-coded explicit model in your brain that's just a direct vector lookup of my eyes saw some, or my ears heard something in this direction, turn my eyes that way. Um, you don't learn to do that. It's just something that your brain knows how to do. It's afforded by your biology. So we have lots of parts in humans that don't learn and some parts that learn. So what are the constraints that apply here? What are the affordances you get by being able to learn? And the, what are the computational constraints like for the problems that things are targeted at? For example, how long do we have to decide if something we see in our peripheral vision is dangerous? Um, how value is it to be flexible? Uh, I can learn whatever language I'm exposed to growing up. I can also acquire second languages if I end up stuck um, in another culture or another context. Uh, that kind of flexibility is definitely useful. And the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is the things we can think through can only be solved at the pace of thinking. And our primitives of thought, there's something else. Uh, concepts, language, so on, they just kind of come to us. And if you have a stroke that takes out just the right or wrong part of your brain, those things don't just come to you anymore. Uh, so there are cer certain affordances and speed in the way that stuff operates that provides your thought and the content of your thought some primitives. Uh, so here's something you might not have thought as a particular human asset. Uh, your brain can encode vagueness. I know some of you are thinking vagueness is the enemy. My job is to sit down with people in requirements meetings and banish all the nasty vagueness away. So I know what I'm building and they're not surprised. And of course, there are downsides to vagueness and there are contexts in which vagueness isn't useful. But why have it at all? Why do anything with vagueness if you're a human? Um, well, maybe it's worth considering vagueness a little more, right? Let's get a handle on what it is. Well, it depends. And I don't mean that as a flippant comment. It's a real problem in formal logical systems. You want to banish all the vagueness from your system, but you're trying to define it, and it turns out vagueness is kind of vaguely defined, and then you end up with your logical system starts out as the complement of a vaguely defined set. So it kind of throws you know, a wrench in things. So it would, I mean, it's an issue, right? And category is a natural language. They're not well behaved. They're not neat hierarchies and predicates. Words work much more like a fuzzy relational graph. Uh, words like game, to bring Wittgenstein up again, they only capture a set of relations to other things. Um, word meaning maps through analogy. Um, and these nodes all, in this relational graph, they all have very fuzzy boundaries. So language is contextual. Also, uh, the meaning of particular words changes on, in context. So you have polysemy, this uh, word for this, um, where in a different context, a word means something different. And there are even cases like auto antonyms. Depending on when I say to seed or to dust, I could be meaning the exact opposite of what I would mean. To seed might be to remove seeds or to put seeds into something. To sanction might mean to allow something or to punish someone. Um, so we have to rely on our world model again. There's some system at work here. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out there are big gotchas if you just try to jam a logic system into something that works with natural language categories. So an example known from antiquity is the Sordes paradox. A modern formulation goes like this. If a poor person is given a penny, they'll still be poor. Therefore, if a poor person is given one trillion pennies, they'll still be poor. Um, this argument should be a sound, valid argument by mathematical induction. The reason it isn't is because the premise is vaguely defined. We could take the poverty line literally, for example, and say if someone making $12,000 per year is given one penny, then they cross the poverty line and they're no longer poor. So therefore, the first premise is wrong. But that's not what poor means, right? It just feels wrong to look at that category in those terms. Um, so again, you know, there are downsides, there are gotchas, so why have vagueness at all? Well, 
it's definitely useful to be able to talk about things in the world. We live at a particular scale. At the scale we live at, our terms and concepts are kind of like a form of lossy compression. Our idea of species, biological sex, societies, higher level physics models, they don't account for everything we encounter at this scale. There are things like ring species, for instance. There are hormonal and genetic differences that throw off neat biological sex models. There are process and measurement noise that are categories of eh, that throw off physics models that we try to derive, at least with the instruments we're able to use. Um, and we also have other affordances from this too. Our ability to make analogies in a more ambiguous, vague space, it's important in programming, in science, in law, in, science, in art. Uh, there are all kinds of technical and creative reasons that you might want to do this. We can also bend meaning on the fly. I could say, every time I say the word vague here in this next sentence, I mean the newly defined species of penguin, known as the vague. Uh, and you could follow me for paragraphs on after that. Um, in fact, my entire discussion of vagueness just now might have strayed a little from the typical philosophical treatment. Um, anyways, these affordances are useful, but I think there's something even more fundamental. Uh, and this comes back to Wittgenstein. Uh, so there's a comment he makes in the work on certainty. In uncertainty, he's analyzing an ontological or epistemological argument from George Edward Moore. That argument goes something like this. Here is one hand, here is another, therefore there are two objects in the external world, therefore there's an external world. Uh, Moore intended this as a refutation of radical skepticism. Things like, are we brains in vats, are we all in a simulation? Well, no, clearly here's an external world. And it's as a just logical argument, there's not a whole lot going on there. It leaves, it's a little wanting. But it also really resonates. And Wittgenstein gave it a detailed treatment and uh, came to this comment. If I want the door to turn, the hinges must stay put. What does that mean here? Knowledge has to be built on something. There ain't no such thing as free knowledge. You have to get started somewhere. You can't see the world without also having a way of seeing the world. Uh, and the capacity of vagueness falls out for having a way of using language and seeing meaning. Um, it comes from here. And that way of using language is a way of getting started. Um, and as humans, we only have limited means of interrogating all these things that fall in this bucket of what we might call hinges. Now for machine learning models, we have a way of thinking about this too. We have the language of bias and variance. I'm going to do some quick disambiguation here. Um, so I mean more like the meaning on the right. There are kind of two ways bias and variance gets used in machine learning. One way is to say how a model performs after it's trained. So for example, a model that's really biased always overestimates. The other way it's used is to say a model uh, to the constraints when the model has to fit something. So you would say a model uh, is biased because it's linear. It will only ever see a linear relation between things. And I mean more the latter case here. Uh, so biases are a way of getting started. Now, there's another option, right? We can have a model that's not biased. We can just make it really high variance. And in fact, deep learning systems are in many ways higher variance than human brains. They're much less biased. There's a really easy way to tell this. You have to show them millions of examples of things instead of just a few um, for all kinds of particular cases. They don't get as much for free. Um, another way of thinking of this bias versus variance problem in the human context is language and the whole poverty of the stimulus problem. We are biased to see language in things and just from the data itself, the problem is completely underdetermined. Uh, and that's because at the end of this high variance equation, there's an intractable search space. If the model could be anything, then we have no choice but to consider everything. And that puts us back in Wittgenstein's shoes, thinking through Moore's argument, wondering how we'll turn the door if we don't first set it on hinges, how we can do anything that has meaning if we can't say, okay, this is an external world. And in classic AI, we have examples of things that function hinge-like too, uh, things like admissible heuristics, uh, for example, in A-star search, making safe assumptions when we add pruning logic to things, uh, constraints, and so on. And in formal logic and mathematics, we have axioms. Um, so all these different systems, these different way of reasonings, they start with some new, some thing that you need. Now, for certain domains, the logical techniques are intractable. So we simply can't model everything through explicit programming. Uh, or as deductive inferences drawn from a limited set of world facts or even an enormous set. Um, 
the problem we're up against may be underdetermined. It may be demonstrably unsolvable with formal methods. It just might not be tractable for a human engineering team to build a solution to it. Um, and it's very clear prior to the entry of deep representations onto the scene that this is how Watson and machine translation and a lot of these other systems were building. The only way they could make incremental progress was to add more rules and branches and rules and branches and to try to do a bunch more hand engineered features. Uh, so these things were running into a diminishing returns of trying to scale and get better until deep representations came onto the scene. Um, and in, an important hinge for humans is the ability to model things approximately. Um, to do so by learning from example cases. And approximately here it doesn't mean terribly, it just means without all the guarantees you might like. Hopefully it's right most of the time, and it's wrong only when you can afford it. It's something that brains and deep learning models, which are inspired by, of course not the same as brains, it's worth saying, but inspired by some of how brains work. It's things they afford us. So there are approximate solutions drawn from example cases or other success criteria that approach correctness but may not have any way of really reaching it or reaching it in a way where it can be explained to us. Um, how does this even work? So the world we experience and observe, it's extremely complex. If we think in terms of scale, everything may work cleanly from first principles, but this is really compounded in what we observe. We're here in the middle of the scale of life, and there's an explosion of complexity there. Life, natural processes, social structures, nation states, economies, um, natural language. People in social sciences and you know, the higher level, like animal behavior type sciences and things, have worked at understanding these things. And there's no like universal law giving in these areas. There are only general tendencies that things tend to fall to. This all may be projected from some physical simple substrate, but when it comes to making sense of it perfectly, that's a real long leap in modeling to go from modeling atoms to getting all of human behavior out of it. So it's quite a tangled mess there. Um, it's not the case, however, that everything we experience is random noise, right? So I have a very natural image here um, and just a complete noise image. And if you sample pixel space for images, it's filled up with noise. And the pictures where you have a lightsaber battle between cats and dogs, they're a much, much smaller uh, portion of this image space. Uh, the same is true for language, right? Every possible co-occurrence of words, well, there's less guesswork here, right? Global, global language models like Love in their first representation, they actually model this matrix out. And the co-occurrence matrix for words is extremely sparse. So the natural co-occurrence of words is just a very tiny subset compared to what is theoretically possible. And here I just gradually go from nonsense symbols to a normal, meaningful sentence. There's a whole lot of space in there that through syntactic, semantics, et cetera, you can slowly close in on possible utterances. Um, so this is little of an oversimplification, but it's the intuition behind what is called the manifold learning hypothesis in deep representations. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go into it. I will say some of it's speculative, but at least the gist of it seems to be approximately true as can be empirically borne out. Uh, you can kind of think of it this way. What deep models give us and their representations give us is a way of addressing places where natural data occur a smaller dimensional embedding from this large uh, dimensional source of observation that we have. So natural sentences, word meanings, images, faces, all of this. There's some representation space um, that we can reduce this down to. Um, again, an address here is a metaphor. You can find the conference center from the address. You don't have to know where the Earth is in orbit right now to find out how to get to this building. There are a lot of simplifications that go into that. Um, so if this sounds like black box magic, magic, uh, black box magic, uh, the annotated presentation will be a good source here. I'll have that link again at the end. Um, mainly what I want to discuss is what are the affordances of these representations. Uh, and these representations occur after the data is untangled and there are various points in a model, a hierarchical model where you can step in and point at a representation. Um, frequently these things are real valued vector spaces. Um, but sometimes in that vector space, there are additional constraints. Um, so certain cost functions can embed a hypersphere or a different shape. There are ways that you can do vector arithmetic, additional cost functions you can wire up if you want to use that space for L2 norms or dot products, uh, cosine distance and so on. You can quantize embeddings, use Hamming distance. Um, the dimensionality is always lower than the naturally occurring dimensionality. 
but it still might be frequently hundreds or thousands of dimensions. Now, all these details aren't so important, but what do you get out of this? Uh, and the important thing is with the vector space models and from empirical learning, you can get some ability to do analogy and reasoning without having first uncovered some ontological account of the world. Uh, so in this DC GAN example here, um, we can take components of images apart with vector arithmetic. Um, so the, the top example here is someone, you know, we can take the representation with glasses, subtract the man out of that and add a woman back in and end up with a woman with glasses. Uh, approximately, but pretty good if you compare it to the bottom example, which is just doing raw pixel arithmetic, which is just in the natural dimensionality of the observations. Um, with words, this affords analogy-like things, right? Puppy minus dog plus cat is kitten. Uh, and you'll notice here, like with worst minus bad plus big is biggest, we can do syntactic and semantic analogies both. We can do things that use proper names um, and so on. So, and this comes out of the unsupervised training process for things like word defect or glove. Now there are processes for trying to refine the space to be used for analogy better that can uh, yield better and more precise analogies. But just from this literal Wittgenstein treatment of a corpus, we can go through and get the ability to, to do some analogic reasoning. Now, the point of this presentation is not that deep learning representations are the best ever, right? It's not my intention to say that these representations are good for every domain. Sometimes capabilities are over-attributed to them, quite a lot, I'd say, with a kind of race to push forward a paper as fast as possible and get the publicity that comes with it. And the point is that these learned representations are solving for problems that are otherwise not tractable or underdetermined. And if you're gonna make use of them, you have to be aware of what the trade-offs are. And the trade-offs are that these solutions are approximate, there might be illusions, or sorry, these representations are approximate, there might be illusions they're subject to. Uh, so here's a human case, right? If you're not familiar with the, the um, checkerboard illusion, it, so the squares A and B are actually the same color uh, in their raw pixel values. It's just the context that makes you resolve them differently. If you're not familiar with this, uh, the other uh, skinelated grid example, the point here is that you can only resolve a few dots at a time, and that is telling you where you're uh, foveating. Now the fovea is just this little tiny bit on the retina. That's about how much you have for high resolution at any point in time and your brain is stitching together this big visual illusion from all these uh, glances that you're doing all the time subconsciously, uh, but your actual visual space is not like that. Um, or your actual raw perceptual input is not like that, I should say. Um, so most of the time it just works though. And of course deep learning models are subject to their own illusions. Um, I didn't realize this slide was gonna be used in the talk yesterday, but you know, so it goes. Uh, you can get confident image predictions from noising things. Luckily, we're aware of this now, and we can re-noise things and use adversarial examples to go back and kind of refine these models, but there are always going to be things out in these spaces where we haven't explored, where there are unexpected illusions. It's just from the nature of the type of solution. And this is another reason to be careful not to do too much over attribution. Um, obviously, much of the history of philosophy and science, from where we mark its beginnings, it's about disentangling illusions that arise from just conditioned, quote, understanding. Um, so we do want to get at definitions. We do want to create logical systems. We want to come up with means to figure out if we're justified in thinking certain things, if we can trust our perception. The point is not to punt on that. Um, but there are some things that are, again, just intractable. So I think the best use of these affordances is, is in mixed systems. This is why AlphaGo, for example, encodes board states using convolutional neural nets. It's the equivalent of just having a good feeling, of just seeing one move ahead uh, when you're a practiced expert. That's a conditioned representation, a conditioned understanding or a conditioned perception that you have. And this is the equivalent of you know, doing some randomized formal search to find the board state that feels the best. Um, and of course, self-driving car efforts, they use deep nets for visual perception, but there are other behaviors you need guarantees and constraints from things like finite state machine models and so on. And of course, interpreting language, um, you need some type of language embedding, even if you might have some other formal structure going on that dictates what you wanna get out of an exchange with a chatbot. So this is a closure conference. Why dig into the philosophical underpinnings of machine learning, in particular, deep learning and how it works and relate it to human knowledge, intelligence, et cetera. And the big point here for me is I think there are really good opportunities for closure in Datomic. Uh, 
So these opportunities emerge out of a system's focus, um, out of making use of both simple data literal representations of things formally and empirical learned representations in conjunction. Again, if we go back to our first scenario, J and D, um, we're talking about where they're informing us about the weather. There are lots of little pieces lying around, but the general system's focus is kind of lagging behind. Um, there are some big, huge teams doing it, but the general desktop data practice isn't really solving this. Um, so I think it's really important to this, what kind of system can realize a mind long range goal. Um, and much of what I wanna focus on here, the like one biggest win is the issue of machine learning and the technical debt it induces. Uh, now there are a few articles on this. I have uh, the big one in the annotations. The big piece here is that models are coupled to all the data they've ever seen. There is a statistical reference class sort of coupling where you always assume all future samples are drawn from the same population as the samples used for the training data. Uh, in practice, this either is frequently not true as a system continues or it wasn't true in the first place when you built a model. Um, they're all your normal code dependencies, sure, for pre-processing, et cetera, but they're dependencies on what other data people are producing for you. All the sources of data you have out in the world feeding into your model. Um, and some of those pieces might be as opaque as an API call. If you have version info for that API call, you're lucky. Um, so some types of machine learning systems and domains are more fragile than others. Vision is really fragile because a change in lighting or device, if the model hasn't seen it, can be a big problem. Uh, language is a little more robust, but if you dive deep down into specialized domains and task specificity, it can become less robust to changes. Uh, and basically these data dependencies, they're like code and library dependencies, but they're worse in every way. Um, so what basis do we have for reasoning about the problems? Uh, if we're unlucky, it could just be a one-off workflow produce, producing a notebook and a model and you have to hope the model works right because the cells aren't in the same order anymore. Um, and these things can lie to you in confusing ways. You, know, you usually hope reasonable data hygiene was exercised, but what's the record that you can interrogate for that? Um, if it's not kept, you won't be able to figure out what's going on and frequently you have to go start over when you're stuck in these problems. So the technical debt problems become much worse. Um, but like the last point says, every data science, every company with a data science team has this problem at some point. The model doesn't work the way the data science team thought it did or would. Uh, it's a very frequent problem. Um, and it's worth saying the machine learning community, they're actively trying to solve this stuff. This TensorFlow is one of these solution shapes, right? You do whatever crazy data science desktop thing you were gonna do, we'll smuggle out a graph and the ops team and the dev team, they'll take that graph and they can just deploy it in their own sane way. Now of course TensorFlow gets tangled up with other pre-processing logic outside of the framework and not everybody knows how to use the framework to get those guarantees, so it's a partial solution here. Uh, other solutions are more drastic. You see one of these blog posts every couple of months of how we went in and cleaned up the mess our data science team made. Um, and it ends up, okay, there are only a few blessed models you can use and here's where you upload your data in the GUI. And if you're somebody who solves machine learning problems with code, you can feel all the creative energy leave your body. Uh, and you know what this framework is telling the data scientists. It's saying, this is why we can't have nice things. Um, so, uh, you know, there are issues with some of these different um, frameworks and things, right? What I want is to have the appropriate primitives and representations to solve these problems and not to have a super opinionated framework forced on me to be the only one in the language that I should use or the only one the organization blesses. Of course, there are performance guarantees those frameworks make that are really nice, um, but having flexibility about using the frameworks is a little better. Um, so the bigger win for me here, the easier thing to latch onto is that I want the data provenance primitives and I want to be able to compose those primitives and use those primitives in my system. And for that, and this is, you know, historically in my use of these systems, there's big datomic wins. So we have a system that does that. It models data provenance. It models your system's knowledge of when things come in and go out and what the world looked like at those points. And I've gotten a lot of mileage out of just putting it center stage here. Uh, now you might be saying, well, machine learning is about big blobby things and so on. Um, you just write the documents, the images, whatever you're doing to S3 and once they're there, you tell Datomic about them and you treat your S3 or whatever other bucket storage you're using as an immutable read-write place or just write, write uh, place and you're set. So there's, you know, there are good solutions here for doing this and most of the technical debt problems, they're data provenance shaped. How did this thing get here? 
you can answer those questions. Why did my system compute inference X? I can grab the exact case of the world there and reproduce it. If Y was the case, would I have computed Z instead? Now that I've updated my model, are there things I'm supposed to recompute that are subject to certain guarantees or haven't been delivered? Um, what data set did I use to train that model again? Or what data set did I give to the data science team there? Did it include this? Should I exclude this from the test data set so I can trust what the model does? Um, of course, you can come up with ways to represent system data provenance in other databases. That's, you know, that's all true. But in this case, this is a super simple thing and it falls out, it's hoisted out of having Datomic in this system. And it's a simple representation, it's this fact store, there's a lot of established literature on how to use that in modeling other problems and you can even do other interesting things with it, like build out a system that can learn a policy using the data provenance information as part of the inputs into that policy as it continues to try to evolve the system over time. Now I'm up against time here, I'm basically out. I think there are other wins in the Clojure ecosystem. There are good tools for ETL. Um, I'm gonna add more examples in the annotations. Stu Holloway's talk on ETL with Clojure and Datomic is a good entry point for this. Um, and there are a whole lot of things in the core philosophy of Clojure. Uh, the biggest things that resonate with me is trying to simplify all the extra stuff in the language that doesn't have anything to do with your domain. Because AI is a huge domain, especially if you're trying to combine representations from symbolic parts and representations from empirical parts. And you don't want a bunch of extra constraints in the language that aren't giving you leverage at solving those problems um, that are outside of the domain of data flow and so on. So the big takeaways here for me, we need models that can learn parts of the problem for themselves and encode it in suitable representations. We have to have some type of empirically derived model, whether it's deep learning or successor text. There are certain things that just aren't gonna be derived cleanly. Um, the other thing is there are people doing machine learning elsewhere. There are problems they're trying to solve that the closure ecosystem, that atomic, et cetera, they're good at solving. And it makes sense to focus on those to make this more of a desirable ecosystem for at least parts of the problem for building the systems approach and getting into that mindset. Um, if we want to get to powerful AI, things that we call minds, um, we're gonna need all of this stuff. We're gonna need to be able to combine to do this hybrid composition of symbolist and connectionist parts. And if we're ambitious, we can take advantage of the primitives we have in Clojure and Atomic to dynamically evolve these systems. So that's the talk. Thank you very much for coming and listening.